Now, what's in the realm of the Wu? So the, the Wu, <laughs> the, the, the Alcubier drive, I guess. Oh, I love it. Yeah, I love that stuff. Now, the Alcubier drive. A lot of people will try to convince you. Oh, we can do this, and basically, I'll tell you, yes and no. All right. Here's how it would work. Basically, the idea is they've mathematically within Einstein's theory of general relativity, they have, and I'm not an expert in this, I, I can't derive it, but I've read the, the papers. There is a way that you can use something called negative mass. Mm -hmm. it, it has all the properties of mass, except instead of being attractive, it's repulsive, right? negative mass i don't know what negative mass is it wouldn't weigh anything <laughs> It'd be the opposite of weighing something whatever that is so who knows what negative mass is I, to the best of my knowledge it's it's not been ever seen in nature but if you postulate its properties you could theoretically shrink space time in front of your spacecraft and expand space time behind it so imagine that you're in the universe, which is limited to light speed. Nature says you can't go travel or traveling faster than light in space time. And that's just a given. We've never seen anything go faster than light. However, if you were able to expand space time behind you, like blowing up a balloon and you're on that balloon, that space time is pushing you, right? At the same time, with that negative mass, you're shrinking space-time in front of you. So you're being pushed by space-time behind you through a shorter space-time in front of you, which means you could travel distances of light years in less than a year. But you would never, in your frame of reference, be going faster than light. What would be happening is you'd be shortening the distance you have to cover. So you're still traveling at some high speed, but instead of doing it across a light year, you shrunk that light year to be half a light year. So from an outside observer's point of view, you'd be going faster than light. But in your reference frame, you wouldn't. So you wouldn't violate the speed of light rule. Great idea. It's probably how a Star Trek warp drive would work. The problem is nobody's ever seen negative mass. We don't know if it exists and don't know if it even can exist. But if it does, we have warp drive. So the one thing, and then we were talking a little bit about this before, so Les, Les has not looked this up. So this is all on me, 100% on me. I'm, I'm to blame. But there is a unit of vibration called a phonon, which is like the sound equivalent of a photon, basically. Correct. And a very, very limited understanding of the entire process and search on the internet by me indicates that it may have a slightly, very slightly negative mass at the quantum scale. Now, this is something that's, I think, relatively recent, maybe in the last five years or, or so. Maybe it's before that, but I, I doubt it. If that is true, Again, it's a big if because I'm probably reading a Wikipedia article. I'm not looking at the source. Oh, it must be case. true if it's on Wikipedia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like everything we, we read and see on the news is. But if that were true, if there were some way to use, to, to get a medium or a material to vibrate in a certain frequency or resonate at a certain frequency that makes use of these phonons, and generate negative mass, is that something that could at least help with this Alcubier drive? Again, I'm at, these are all big. Wow. If, if this negative mass property is real, and if it's not for some fundamental physics reason constrained to the quantum realm, right? Right. And a lot of things are, right? right. But if for some reason it's not, then, then yes you could engineer something that would give us a warp drive. I would think that's my novice opinion, but I, I have to give the caveat. I don't know if that's real. And if it can, even if it is real, can it exist beyond the quantum 
level, right? right? There are a lot of things like that. One of my favorites is, I wrote about this in my novel, Mission to Methany. This was my space drive that I came up with in that novel for Bayon. And quantum tunneling is, is fun. I've always been fascinated by quantum tunneling. And basically, this, the quantum mechanics allows things to happen that under Newtonian physics just can't. And, and nature... That's why it's been so revolutionary. It's why we have computers and lasers and you name it. Well, it's right? like quantum communication, right? That's that's the so-called Ansible from Orson Scott Card, right? Right. That that's exactly right. Actually, I hadn't thought of that. So, I mean, he probably hadn't thought of that when he, when he wrote it, either. right? Yeah. Right. But. So basically, what it says is, if you get to create what's called a potential well, and you put a particle in here, and you, it doesn't have enough energy to get out of the cup right? It's only got so much energy. And to get out of this cup, it's got to get enough energy that it can bounce over the top to get out. And under conventional physics, if you say it's got X energy and it needs 2X energy to get out, it'll never get out. But if it's on the atomic level, what they observed, and this is what led to the quantum revolution, because it explains radioactive decay, is it sits there and it sits there and it sits there and all of a sudden it's over here. <laughs> okay. And that's quantum tunneling because Something weird happens on that level, and things are not always constrained by their energy. There's a small chance that just statistically some quirk's going to happen, and it's going to end up over here. It has to do with the size of its wave function. And there's a guy named de Broglie who figured out that you know light has a wavelength and a frequency. Well, so does mass. And once you think about individual atoms as having a wavelength and a frequency, you can spread that wavelength out over distances which means sometimes it's going to be here and sometimes it's going to be here. That's how you get quantum tunneling because it really isn't just a point particle that's existing here. It's a smushed out particle that's in here most of the time. And some of the time it's actually out here because its wavelength crosses that potential barrier. And so that is what gives you quantum tunneling. Well, if you, when you realize that microscopic things, atoms do that all the time. That's how radioactive decay works. That's how I mentioned radon gas. That's how we get radon decayed from uranium. The uranium just sits there. But over time, particles quantum tunnel out, and it decays into other elements, and you eventually get radon. You eventually get your potassium atom that decays in your banana, okay? But if you had that on a macroscopic object, say you, you have a wavelength. And that can be calculated using an equation provided by the great physicist Louis de Broglie. And that wavelength is extremely small. And that's the reason you don't teleport across the room. <laughs> okay. It's an extremely low probability. I had a, a, a test in graduate school in my quantum class, which I love because I'm a science fiction guy even then. And Are it was you basically it is possible for a Oh, it's possible. It's possible. It's absolutely possible. It is possible. It's highly unlikely. Un highly unlikely. And I had to calculate this as a graduate student. And I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was something like this. He gave us the, the specifications of the desk in front of us how heavy it was and what it was made from. We could then figure out what atoms are in there and how many atoms are in there. Apply de Broglie's equation statistically to the number of atoms that are in there and calculate how likely it was that the table would suddenly tunnel to the other side of the room. Which okay. Which is basically the probability that all of the atoms in the table would, which is much lower than the probability of an individual atom. Absolutely. Absolutely. It turned out it would be like five times the lifetime of the universe. <laughs> before that happened once in the universe, right? So it's an extremely low probability event, but it's not zero. Okay. And so for me, I'm sitting there thinking, wow, what if we could control that? What if we found a way to force the wavelength of my table or my spaceship to tunnel from here to there, right? Externally, what if I had some kind of tunneling field that I turn on that says, now go, and I force it to tunnel over there? It's all science fiction, but you know, might not be impossible. Don't know how to do it. It's sort of like the negative mass thing, but mm, would that'd that be, be really cool. Would that be something like shining an external beam on it that would trigger that effect? or would that I have no idea. Like I can make up something and I have a science fiction novel, but, <laughs> but we can force on the atomic level atoms to make transitions, okay, to a different state and induce this kind of behavior on an individual atomic scale. We would have to figure out how to do that on a macroscopic scale, and we don't know how to do that, but it might not be impossible. Might not okay. be impossible. So that's kind of like 
well, I guess you would put that under teleportation or. Oh yeah, it is teleportation. That's exactly what it is. Yep. That's exactly right. It would be. Okay. Now what about wormholes, manipulating wormholes to travel faster? What's again, it's another kind of woo topic, but. Well, I, I love wormholes. You know, the idea is on one end, you've got a black hole, which is something super, super massive, and all this mass is crunching in, and it gets beyond the point where fusion can keep it from collapsing on itself, and it goes down to the point where eventually light itself can't even escape, and you have what's called a singularity. Well, there are some theories that say that that singularity warps space-time so much, because matter bends space-time, Okay. A whole other lecture. I could talk 30 minutes about this. Solar gravity lensing that Einstein predicted, called an Einstein cross. We do it all the time. Basically, what that means is really massive objects act like a big magnifying glass, and they bend light. You know, my glasses refract light, which means it bends light to a focus to help me see, because my eyes don't do it right. Space-time can bend light also. The sun bends space-time, and it brings it to a focus. And there is a focus for our sun, for light, that's at 550 times the Earth's sun distance. It's 550 astronomical units. And so at that distance, the sun acts like a big magnifying glass, and if you put an ant out there, it's going to fry it. <laughs> okay, if you were a kid and you did that kind of thing. Well, what's really cool about that is if you put a telescope there, you can magnify images from across the universe and see things. And there's a mission called the Solar Gravity Lens Mission, where a scientist at JPL, and I'm, a, I'm on the propulsion team looking at that, wants to place essentially a small space telescope out at that distance and use the bending of light from the sun to image exoplanets and see if anybody's walking around on the streets. So I, I think it's a pretty, pretty cool idea, and it should work. Now, it's years away because that's a long way. and We don't know how to get out there yet. But go look it up. It's called the Solar Gravity Lens Mission. It is way cool. And there's some neat animations. The, the scientist is Dr. Slava Turashev from JPL. And uh, I've worked with Slava and, and had him helped a little bit with some of the propulsion systems that would get his telescope out there. But anyway, this bending of space-time at a black hole theoretically can shorten the distance to another part of the universe. It's that whole... You know, you inflate space-time, shrink space-time. This is like radical shrinking and bending of space-time where you take, you know, this part of space-time here and you connect it to this part and there's no distance between them. And that other part would be called a white hole where you come out, right? Yep. Theoretically, I think it's uh, Kip Thorne came up with this and it was in the movie Interstellar. Yeah, that might work, okay? The problem is, and it's actually not a problem. It's a good thing because we might be dead if there were one nearby. There are probably no wormholes anywhere close to our solar system. Okay? Because there are no black holes anywhere close to our solar system. So if we're going to get to a black hole to travel through the wormhole to get somewhere else in the universe, we've got to have an interstellar drive just to get there, to get in the gate. Okay? And even then, I don't know that a conventional ship could survive the gravity to travel through the black hole because it would probably be shredded and... Yeah, you'd just be, you know, turned into goop and then smashed and part of the black hole. So, you know, it, it's a neat idea, but eh, whether it's practical or not, I don't know. Now, what about anti-gravity? Well, if I go back to this negative mass thing, in theory, it ought to have the same properties as mass, only in reverse, which means instead of attractive, it would be repulsive. So if you had negative mass, anti-gravity, It'd be great because that would allow you to get from the surface of the earth up in the air pretty high, fire your rocket, get out of the gravity well, turn it on, bend space time, create Yale Crubier warp drive, and you're off at warp factor 10. So, yeah, that'd be great. But again, I, I put that in the science fictional realm until we discover, you know, real negative mass. All right. Here, here's another one. You keep hitting them out of the park. I'm like the worst pitcher in the world. What about the zero point energy? What is zero point energy? It's, isn't it the cashmere effect or is that my way off? Well, that's one way to take advantage of the zero point energy. Okay. This is mind bending stuff. <laughs> this were the 60s. I make a joke about LSD or something, but I won't do that. It, it's found that on the quantum level, vacuum is not really nothing. Space time is there. And this is where you're getting, into my opinion, the woo woo of physics mm -hmm. because we have not. We don't have a theory currently that reconciles Einstein's theory of relativity 
which explains how the universe works on a big scale with quantum mechanics and how it works on the small scale. And it is postulated, and I think it's even been measured, that space itself at, a, at the quantum level, very, very small level, is popping in and out of existence constantly, okay? That there are particles created and annihilated at such a rate and at such a volume that it looks like nothing's there on average. <laughs> because on average, there's nothing there, right? And we see the average. We don't see it happening at that level. But if that's correct, then there's an extreme amount of energy available just in nothingness, space. And if you can capture that, you can turn it into workable energy, and we have an infinite power source for free. And the Casimir effect is one notional way to do that. And the idea, and this has been measured, so it's kind of real, but how you turn it into real useful work, I don't know. And basically, two flat parallel plates, really small, but really close together. And they're so close together that as these virtual particles pop in and out of existence at the quantum scale, some of them are too big to pop into existence between the plates because they wouldn't fit. And when that happens, you are getting a pressure from out here to push these plates together because you don't have as many particles allowed to be created in the middle as you do out here. So there's more virtual stuff being created out here than there is in the middle and it applies a pressure to cause the plate to smash together that's been measured it's real it's called the casimir effect how you turn that into an energy system i don't know my friend and co-writer frequently travis taylor played around with that in his first novel warp speed so, you know, it's a lot of fun to speculate about, and I would recommend that book if you want to read some some really exciting stuff about how that might work. Turning that into something practical, I haven't seen any good ideas for that. And not to say it's impossible, it's just I, I haven't seen anything. Okay, what exotic, crazy propulsion system, aside from magic? <laughs> well, I mean, there's the there's the one that is used by the Millennium Falcon in Star Wars, which is basically you travel through another dimension. And then you pop back into ours. And in that other dimension, the now laws of nature are different. And you can travel faster than light and just drop back into our normal universe, subspace. Well, that's great. What is that? <laughs> you know, we don't know well, another dimension. When you say another dimension, do you just mean like a fourth physical dimension? Or do you mean? A, a, a tenth space? physical dimension or something. I mean, okay. it's just, you know, it, it's, to me, it's total, it's science fiction. It, not even that. It's just fantasy, right? Because there's no evidence that such dimensions really exist. It's just saying, well, if there were one and it had these properties, then we could do this. And wonderful. But, you know, again, it's it's not been measured. It's not been postulated. We don't see any evidence that it exists. But it, it's great device in Star Wars. And then you have a lot of science fiction stories where you, well, I'll just, you know, give examples of one of my favorite writers, David Weber, right, has these warp points which are naturally occurring out in the solar system for some reason that has to do with general relativity, which not a lot of detail is given, not even for the interested reader, because they're really, they don't know, that allows you to pop to other warp points, you know, in other stellar systems. Chuck Gannon, it's I think, like, uses it. like Stargate sort of. Yeah, thing. Stargate kind of stuff. But they talk about it being a wormhole, an artificial wormhole that they create in Stargate. And okay, maybe, but I don't know how you would do that. It's still, you know, total fantasy. But that's out of science fiction, and it's fun to think about, but eh, I don't think nature's going to let us do that anytime soon. But I do have to, to say, any physicist who says any of this is impossible is going to be proven wrong. Because we don't know exactly how nature works. If we did, we'd have explanations for dark energy and dark matter, right? So there's obviously something we don't understand. So our physics theory is incomplete. We also haven't married quantum mechanics to relativity. And until we do, our understanding of how nature works is not complete. So my answer is, you know, these are fun things to think about. Most of them probably will never turn into anything in the woo-woo. But we don't know it all yet. And that's what's exciting about science, is somebody's going to make a discovery to unite 
quantum mechanics with gravity or to really explain dark energy or dark matter. And it's going to be a new theory of physics. And that's going to tell us more about nature and maybe open one of these doors. So I'm optimistic. For those who aren't technically or scientifically inclined, just very briefly, what's dark energy, what's dark matter? Ah, good question. Sorry about that. Dark energy is really interesting because what they found is the Big Bang is pretty much known to have happened. If you look at all the galaxies, they're racing away from each other. And the further away they are, the faster they're racing away. And if you look at the directions these are all moving and you run the clock backwards, you find out that if you look at the acceleration and the velocity and you say, okay, if we're here now and we're there next week and we're there the week after, we ought to be able to predict where we were the week before that and the week before that and the week before that. And you start going back in time and you find that it looks like the whole universe started at some point and exploded outward and space time just expands and goes out. Well, the idea that physicists had was that that rate of expansion would either be constant, stretching out, or that all that mass, which is pulling on each other, would slow down the expansion and eventually pull it back together into the big crunch. And in fact, up until about 25 years ago, I think most physicists assumed that the rate of expansion of the universe would eventually stop, it would contract, all that mass would pull it back together until it got back down to a point, and then the cycle would start over again. And that the universe essentially had been around forever. Boom, 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 right? No, that's not happening. What's happening is the rate of expansion is accelerating, and we don't know why. And the only way to explain that is if the energy content of the universe is increasing. What does that mean? It means that something, probably in the vacuum of space-time, there's a net energy input into the universe that's pushing everything apart faster and faster. They've calculated how much energy that would have to be to account for the acceleration that we see, and that's dark energy. Because it's dark because we don't know what it is or where it's coming from or how it works. So it's behind this curtain of darkness, okay? Dark energy. Dark matter is another problem. And that is that we, we look at our solar system and the planets orbit the sun and they take, you know, a year, whatever their year is, ours is 365 days to go around the sun and all the planets orbit at different speeds and that varies as you get out to the edge of the solar system, the orbital velocity changes. That's why at some times, you know, Mars is over here and other times in the year, Mars is on the other side of the sun, right? We, we don't always have Mars in the same position relative to where we are as we go around the sun. Right. And so when they looked at galaxies and they said, well, those probably work the same way. I mean, you've got this big, massive black hole in the middle of the galaxy and you've got all these stars circling it. So if we look at the velocities at which the stars are going around the center of the galaxy, we'll do the math and it would be like the planets in the solar system, right? You'd have different stars at different distances traveling at different rates. But instead, I wish I had a plate. This is a physics problem for you. This is a square plate. Imagine it's a circle. <laughs> okay. So what they found is instead of the stars all doing, you know, woo, 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 circling really rapidly around the solar system, I'll put it up here so I don't get darkened by my light. The whole thing is turning at kind of a uniform rate, which means everything is staying kind of aligned as we circle around. And so they said, well, that shouldn't happen. The stars aren't massive enough for that. Why is that? So they started figuring out how much mass would have to be in the galaxy for or around the galaxy for everything to move as it does and it's a lot more than we see and that we think is there like a lot more and they don't know what it is or where it came from or how it works and so there have been all kinds of weird things postulated you know dark matter is something that doesn't interact with normal matter and except in gravity and there's big halos of dark matter around galaxies that outmass the galaxy in some cases Great. <laughs> I'm not a cosmologist. Maybe they're going to figure that out. But to me, it sounds like hmm, dark energy, dark matter, relativity doesn't work with quantum mechanics. I think we don't understand as much as we think we do. And so I think there's another 
physics theory that's going to burst forth from somebody far smarter than me that is going to tie some of these together and give us an explanation. And when it does, hopefully it'll give us negative mass and something else so that we can reach the stars a little easier. Any last words for the, for the audience? <laughs> this is some good stuff, Les. I mean, this is really good well, stuff. well, I guess my last words, you know, since I am speaking as private individual Les Johnson and not, not for my employer, I'm going to put in a plug for my books back here, if I may. My latest book is A Traveler's Guide to the Stars, published just toward the end of, of 2022 by Princeton University Press. And it's a popular science book, not a textbook that explains a lot of these propulsion systems I've talked about, plus other science related to traveling to another star. It's basically a riff off Hitchhiker's Guide to take the average person on how we really might reach the stars. The book's been very well received. It's my best-selling book so far, by far. It's being translated in South Korean, Japanese, Arabic, and I just heard it may be translated into Hebrew which is interesting. And there's a Chinese publisher looking at it. So I'm pretty excited. I might have a multi-language publication here soon. It was well-received in Analog, Wall Street Journal. Got some really good reviews, so I'm thrilled with that. My other late book over here is a science fiction novel from Bain called The Space-Time War. And it's my first foray into grand space opera. And I play around a little bit with time dilation and time travel and the whole space-time warping thing and warping of space-time in some interesting ways that may or may not be possible, I won't say, but to make you think and have fun, hopefully. So forgive me for my shameless plugs. You can follow me on my website, lesjohnsonauthor.com, oh, and oh, I'm on Facebook. Excellent, excellent. So, yep, that's my uh, last words. All right. Thank you, my friend. It was a pleasure. That was a lot of fun. Thanks for putting up with me, and I'm sorry I started getting hoarse. Oh, I didn't even notice. I'll talk to you soon, my friend. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed this video, hit like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.